This is Agriculture Today. I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network. Ahead of us today on this Tuesday's program, we start with a two-part series with two K-State distinguished professors, Roman Ganta and Hans Kutzia. They both share with listeners their latest breakthrough research resulting in the creation of a successful vaccine against bovine anaplasmosis. Ganta and Kutzia both bring their diverse expertise to the table, Ganta as the director of the Center of Excellence for Vector-Borne Diseases, and Kutzia as the head of the Anatomy and Physiology Department in the K-State College of Veterinary Medicine. We end with this week's Milk Lines from K-State Dairy Specialist, Mike Brook. That and more awaits us ahead on Agriculture Today. Today we are back now, and we have two guests with us: Roman Ganta. He is a distinguished university professor here at K State, and he serves as the director for the Center of Excellence for Vector Diseases. And we also have with us Hans Kutzia. He is also a university distinguished professor here at K State, and also serves as the department head of anatomy and physiology in the College of Veterinary Medicine. So, thank you both for being here this afternoon. Thank you, Samantha. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Before we get started into today's topic, which is going to be really interesting because it's a vaccine that you guys are developing currently, let's start a little bit with the areas that you guys work in. Tell us a little bit about your programs. Sure. Uh, I'll go first. Absolutely. <laughs> um, like uh, Samantha mentioned, I'm uh, the director for Center of Excellence for Vector-Borne Diseases. We started this about uh, in 2015 with a bigger picture, how to make, uh, how to find a solution to major tick-borne diseases impacting food animals like cattle Mm -hmm. and companion animals like dogs and also for people because in the U.S. that became a serious concern that various federal agencies are looking ways to solve this problem. But I think major problem, it's like an underdog. People don't even realize that how impactful it is when it comes to the food animals. Mm -hmm. Like we're talking today about bovine anaplasmosis, which is a major problem in improving the animal health as well as milk and meat production, not only in the U.S., but throughout the world and costs in billions of dollars. So that I will discuss more about that as we go along. But we have the funding from federal agencies, foundations, and private donors. We welcome any kind of funding from any sources because our goal is to find solutions to solve the problems that are pressing all these various animals. So that's what I have been, about 25, 30 years I have been working on this kind of research. And now we focus a lot more on vaccine development because I believe that vaccine development is the best way to solve any disease. I think for now I'll stop that and maybe let Hans introduce himself and then we'll come back. So I I serve as uh, head of the Department of Anatomy and Physiology, but I also have a research program, and so I'm trained as a clinical pharmacologist. So my group is very interested in how drugs work in food animals, and one of the drugs we focused on has been chlortetracycline, which is commonly used to control anaplasmosis. And as many of your your listeners will know, uh, recently those drugs uh, became restricted under the Veterinary Feed Directive, and so it's become more challenging to use these drugs out in range uh, conditions. And we've also found in our research that they just don't work very well to control anaplasmosis. And in addition to that, there's concerns around antimicrobial stewardship. So are we using these drugs effectively to prolong their usefulness for us both in agriculture and also in human medicine to control infections? And so through that work, I have collaborated for many years with with Roman and are very excited about being a small part of this work looking at a vaccine um, because this ultimately helps us to solve this issue around antibiotic stewardship and timing of when we give cattle CTC in the mineral. Is it even working? Are the animals receiving enough drug? There's many issues around that uh, control method. And so the vaccine is a really uh, exciting breakthrough for agriculture to be able to uh, address this need to control this really serious infection. I think I read it most recently in our KSRE newsletter. There was an article about it, and it caught my attention immediately because, like you said, this is just such a big issue that our producers are facing, and it's an important. So let's start and focus in a little bit more on this research. Oh, then. Let, 
Let, let me give a little more background and then I will tell you. That way I think uh, uh, those listeners will appreciate. Bhavan anaplasmosis, as I mentioned, is a major concern. And why now vaccine? Why don't we have a vaccine? That always is a burning question. Why are we not solving this problem? Well, there was a vaccine. Uh, about 20 years ago, it was taken off in the early 90s. It was whole bacterial antigen inactivated vaccine. It was marketed, took it off. A couple of companies sold it. It wasn't working. And then there is a new vaccine came into the market, essentially the same path. It's a Louisiana State University-based, ina- same inactivated vaccine. But there was no research demonstrating how good this vaccine is. But emergency use authorization is already given, and it is in the market, and people do use it, farmers. But we hear all the time it's not working. So then we felt that there is definitely need to address this. So that's where our exciting research came. Our exciting research is to find what works the best in taking care of the disease. So to do that, we need to understand how the disease works and how the infection causes the host to induce immunity and why it fails. So it's basically fundamental basic science is the key. We realize that the best way to protect animals is to allow the animals to see the same kind of infection, the same channels through which the good immunity can be developed Mm -hmm. at not causing a disease. How can we do that? If you take, it is like you have the whole car, but it cannot drive because you took the engine off or a wheel off. That's exactly what we do in our science. We modified using molecular methods to take a part of the bacterium, make it very defective for it to cause a serious disease. But it's still alive, viable organisms, but do not cause the disease. So when it's going through the proper channels in inducing the immunity, like I said, the car analogy, it looks like the car. So they think, okay, there is something that we need to stop this car moving fast like that. But now we are giving the opportunity for this animal to stop this disease progression. Then we challenge that with a live virulent infection. We expected that it will protect, and indeed that's exactly what we have seen. That's why this research is all in two ways, because we identified an innovative method to create a vaccine, and it worked very well when we tested in the animal settings. This is where the collaboration come into picture. I am not trained as a veterinarian, but Dr. Hans and Dr. Mike uh, Klinhans, and we have USDA colleagues and other people. We came together, right? why not you help with this idea that we came up with and with his uh, experience, and he has right kind of animals that he said, Roman, you can go ahead and use this in this study. And then we tested them. And then animals were fully protected. There is no clinical disease. Bacterial load went down. So obviously, we did two things here. Tested whether the existing vaccine works and did not work. And we tested our modified live vaccine, and it worked beautifully. And we have more work in progress because there are two ways, rather three ways, the infection can progress in animals. Mechanical transmission, when the animals are dehorned or any other procedures, pathogen can go. Other way, it's a tick-transmitted pathogen. It's an ectoparasite. Anytime a tick is infected, it passes the disease. There are 20 different ticks which can pass this bug. And transverally, there is a possibility that placentally the babies can get it also. So now we tested first with mechanical. It worked. Now currently work in progress. We tested with tick transmission. The vaccine still worked. Now we want to see how long this protection is going to be and whether or not we can protect a range of animals, which I can talk more about that too as well. So there's a lot. This is why it is exciting. This is why it was picked up by highly impactful research publication in a scientific journal, and that's where you wanted to talk to me. You explained modified life so well there, that car analogy. It's a perfect explanation of how it works. It's the car itself, just no engine involved. Right? Exactly. Yeah, that's such a great explanation of it, because I feel like a lot of producers obviously use modified live vaccines, but like you mentioned, this is the first of its kind for this disease specifically. Exactly. Which is fascinating. Yeah, and I think that's what's exciting for for producers is this technology is not that far removed in terms of concepts that they're familiar with. BVD virus is typically a modified live vaccine. Producers are very familiar with the fact that those vaccines have to be handled very sensitively in order for them to be effective in the field. And so this is innovative because it's the first real example of a modified live vaccine being applied to a tick-borne infection and effectively so in a way that 
could provide us a gateway to protecting animals against this devastating disease in a way that we haven't been able to up until now. And so that's the part that I think our, our producers and your listeners will be, will be most excited about is that here's a vaccine where there's actually data to support its effectiveness. Absolutely. And I think the efficacy of it, the use of it, and its effectiveness is so important and key here because, like you said, there were vaccines that were on the market, but they weren't the most effective at actually doing what Not we for to do. Mm-hmm. So this is exciting because now you've proved that this vaccine does in fact work. That concludes part one of this two-part segment series with Dr. Ganta and Dr. Kutia sharing their breakthrough research that has led to the development of an effective vaccine against bovine anaplasmosis. After the short break, we will return with more from them on what next steps for their research really includes, an important upcoming conference that they will be attending in Reno, Nevada, and the important role that you, yes you, tuning in, can play in allowing for this exciting vaccine to actually be readily available for use among producers. Once again, that was Roman Ganta, a university distinguished professor here at K-State, who also serves as the director of the Center of Excellence for Vector-Borne Diseases. And Hans Kutzia, the university distinguished professor also from K-State, who is also the head of the anatomy and physiology department in K-State's College of Veterinary Medicine. We will be back with more ahead from these two and also this week's Milk Line segment, which as always will come from our K-State dairy specialist, Mike Brook. Once again, that and more awaits us ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We are back now with part two of this two-part segment series with Dr. Ganta and Dr. Kutia, who are sharing their breakthrough research that has led to the development of an effective vaccine against bovine anaplasmosis. We'll continue on with the second part of this interview now. Yes, I would like to extend a couple of things here. Please do. Uh, I think this this is very important, right on time, because uh, Hans just brought up a little bit ago about chlorotetracycline use. And we have a project from California, and the uh, funding came from Russell Rustici Rangeland Cattle Research Foundation Endowment. And that funding is given to UC Davis, University of California, Davis faculty. But they heard that the research that we're doing is so innovative that they bypassed all that rule. But they put a clause that I should still work with UC Davis faculty. (laughs) But they transferred all the money to us to do that. But let me explain to you what we have done and what we are doing it, which tells you how important it is. We tested over 1,000 samples from California from various farms. We also tested samples from Missouri, and Missouri samples are very unique because this farmer came to Hans, and then he mentioned that they're constantly supplementing a mineral supplement of CTC, chlorotetracycline, yet animals are getting sick, yet animals are dying. So then we tested them, and those animals have about 50 to 60% positive. Same whether they're coming from California are in Missouri, it, so it makes no difference. And so what is more is providing this CTC, you are unnecessarily promoting the antibiotic-resistant bacterium and maybe back to other bacteria as well, which ultimately end up in food chain, which is even a more concern for us because these are food animals. So it's very clear that this disease is widespread. Yes, there are some farm practices one can do to improve containing the disease, but right now it is definitely urgent need. I think we have a great opportunity to expand the research and make this available very soon. Absolutely. I think antibiotic resistance is such a hot-button topic, and it's something that's at the forefront of a lot of producers' concerns just because of the effects it really could have on not only their operations but a global food supply chain if that becomes even more prevalent. So Mm -hmm. vaccines, like you said, being at the forefront, preventing having to use that is so important. Mm -hmm. And we're we're getting a lot more reports from the field where um, producers are concerned about 
um, the claw tetracycline not being effective in controlling anaplasmosis. Even here in Kansas, there have been several reports of cases here in Flint Hills where folks have fed claw tetracycline every year and it, it's been effective and then suddenly one year it's not. And it can be devastating to lose large numbers of animals to this disease, especially in, in cases where the, the animals are out on pasture or on range and, and may not be looked at as frequently as we do in, in close confinement operations. And so that makes it more challenging to control the disease in those conditions. So a vaccine is going to be a breakthrough for us in terms of control. Sure. So in terms of how this research continues on from here, what are some next steps? <laughs> Good question. Well, research is expensive. Creating modified vaccine is not that easy, particularly these obligate intracellular bacteria like anaplasma. Put things in perspective, we spent almost 10 years to develop this technology. Now we're applying it very rapidly. And now what next? There are lots of different strains circulating throughout the country. You need to have a protection not just for one strain, for multiple strains. So now we're mapping the strains for which we need support. We are also interested in see how long is this protection when we do that. What magic bullets that we need to offer so that the protection is good as long as the farmer has the animals, whether it's a beef cattle or a dairy cattle. And can we protect the newborn calves? So those are all the things that we need to look at, which is very expensive. So what I'm going to do is I'm writing a grant to U.S. Department of Agriculture in August. Uh, hope is that we uh, get the funding. And I'm also reaching out wherever possible. And I mentioned all this research. And again, like I mentioned, it was already spread very quickly. And National Cattlemen's and Beef Association was very excited about the research. They invited me to give a talk on their national meeting, which is going to take place July 25th to 27th in Reno. I will be attending there, and I'm trying to see if anybody is willing to fund in addition to whatever the endowment fund that we got. Yeah, there are a lot of things to do, and uh, we might look at what are the reasons why antibiotics are not working, and what can we do about it? Is there, are there any alternative antibiotics that we can look? Hans is an excellent expert on the pharmacokinetics and uh, antibiotics and so on. We might extend the collaborations to figure it out because not necessarily vaccine is available to everybody in the world, right? So there may be other opportunities for people to find solutions for this problem. This problem is real. This problem is not only in the U.S. This problem is India. This problem is South America, North America, Asia, Wherever, no matter where you go, we were in Grenada. I have a collaborative project with St. George University in Grenada. We collected samples from cattle. They're all positive, very high percentage. So there's no difference where you go because this bug is in the red blood cells, which is in the blood. And it's easy for them to gain access. And red blood cells don't have nucleus. They don't have a fighting mechanisms. So it's easy for the parasite, this bacterium, to grow very well and spread. So it's going to be a long challenge if you don't have solutions. So we're, I'm looking at two ways to solve this, vaccine and a good drugs. I think the key sort of take-home message for your producers is I think the question they'll have now is where can I buy this vaccine? This sounds like a great solution for the problems that I'm having with anaplasmosis, and so I want to buy this vaccine now. And that's where we sort of have to temper expectations is that we have a, an outstanding candidate that Roman has developed, but we really need some partnership now too with, with some pharmaceutical companies that are interested in taking this to the next step. Certainly modified live vaccines have a very well-established a pathway towards regulatory approval, but that process is expensive and requires then the scaling up of a manufacturing facility to be able to do this in, at a scale that will provide vaccine to meet the demand of the, of the producers. And so, unfortunately, uh, you can't go out and buy this vaccine or get it from your veterinarian at this point in time. But what producers can do is, you know, visit with their veterinarians or visit with uh, representatives from the pharmaceutical industry and, and say to them that this is a vaccine that meets an urgent need in the industry and encourage them to come talk to Roman and get some information on how we can partner, we as K-State can partner to be able to move this into a commercial realm where it can be available for producers to use. Thank you. This is definitely a game changer and Hans is right on money. I think those producers should go and push those 
others, clinicians, let them know this is something in forthcoming, but I think there should be a partnership with some industry so that we can take it to the market. We are working very hard, but I think it will be ideal if someone comes back to us and says, we would like to work with you. We are pushing that on the path already, but it will be good. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think word of mouth and firsthand accounts from producers, like you mentioned, nothing is more powerful than someone's testimony saying, I experience this problem every day. I think that this would be something worthwhile pursuing. So, like you said, encouraging producers and stakeholders, hopefully at the right. NCBA mm-hmm. event that you were attending, to speak up and talk to those that they know within their network, I think is really important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. I know you're both extremely busy individuals, so I was happy that when you responded and I was able to track you down. So thank you so much. Very happy to talk. It's always a pleasure to share what we do. Science is exciting, but science is impactful, and science is something to make the difference. I think at a Kansas State University and College of Veterinary Medicine, we are proud to contribute all that. Absolutely. And if listeners are listening and they want to learn more, if they want to read more about the research that you guys are currently doing, what are some resources that they can look into to see that? Roman has an excellent website for the Center of Excellence for Vector-Borne Diseases, and I would certainly direct them to that. There are other resources available, too. Several articles have been written on this topic. Um, Roman's publication is available in open access, so people who want a, a higher level of scientific information can access that information. And there was a press release that was released by K-State earlier this week that also contains a lot of that useful information as well. So those are all places where, where people can get additional uh, information or reach out to, to either of us or Roman with technical questions about the vaccine or uh, me in the case of practical control strategies for anaplasmosis. We know that anaplasmosis season is coming up and producers know that this is a disease of the fall here in the Flint Hills and, and we will start seeing more and more cases from September through to November. And so just to be aware that we're still predicated on the use of antibiotics to control the disease, but there are exciting developments in the pipeline. We just need to get them over the finish line here to to be able to put them in the hands of producers where they really are needed. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samantha. All of those resources were just mentioned will be in the show notes of today's program, as always, and those show notes can be found on agtoday.net. So if you're looking for more, which I think anybody listening will be interested in reading more, be sure to check those out. Once again, that was Roman Nganta. He is the University Distinguished Professor here at K-State and the Director of the Center of Excellence for Vector-Borne Diseases, as well as Hans Kutzia. He is also a University Distinguished Professor here at K-State and the Department Head of Anatomy and Physiology in the College of Vet Med. We'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. Listening to Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Along with Samantha Bennett, I'm Jeff Wickman. Up next, K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook with Milk Lines. This week, Mike discusses options for calculating a fair price for this year's corn silage. Today, I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning how we're going to price corn silage in the field this fall. I know many of you, as we get closer and closer to corn silage, you're going to be working with some of your farmer growers to determine a fair price for the corn silage. And with the price of corn, probably be a little different than what we used to think of as a normal price for corn silage. So what are some various things that we can do to determine a fair price for this corn as it stands in the field? Most of you are familiar, we have over the years had a kind of a rule of thumb that seven to nine times the bushel price of corn would be the price for a ton of corn silage. So if corn is worth seven bucks a bushel and we'd use the seven times figure, that means we'd be about $49 per ton of corn silage. This would be assuming that the corn silage was 35% dry matter. Now, let's think about some other things. When corn is expensive and we have a high bushel price, maybe it's better to look at something like grain yield and then use that as a measure to determine what the value of that 
corn silage should be on a per ton basis. So here's an example. Let's say we have the grain estimated in the field, and it's estimated to be 100 bushel per acre. Well, as you stop and think about this, if the corn is 100 bushel per acre and the corn is worth $7 a bushel, that'd be $700 for the whole acre. Now, some other things to consider. One would be what's the tonnage yield going to be, and that's going to vary quite a bit. Some areas we've had great growing season and some not so great based on the amount of water that we have. So that tonnage per acre is going to vary quite a bit. could be anywhere from, say, a low of 16 tons to an acre to a high of maybe 24, 25 tons to the acre. If we're under irrigation, it'd be even higher than that. But then the grain yield would probably be also higher. So back to our example. If we have 100 bushel to the acre and it's $7 a bushel, that's about $700 an acre. If we have a 20-ton yield, that would mean about $35 per ton of corn silage. Again, a lot of assumptions going in there. Now, some other things to think about as we start to price this is who's paying for the harvest cost. Many times we're buying corn standing in the field. So if we're buying corn standing in the field, generally the dairy farmer is going to be the one responsible for the harvest cost. And, you know, depending on how far we're hauling and those sorts of things, if we're putting it in a bag or we're putting it on a pile, that could be anywhere from, uh, say, a low of maybe $13 a ton to a high of 16 or $17 a ton, again, depending on the haul. So that would go on top of that. So if we use the grain yield times the value of the corn, and then we look at the price of chopping and those sorts of things added onto that, well, we could be getting fairly close to that $49 that we just calculated a little bit ago, or even a, a little bit uh, higher. So does the seven to nine times the bushel price of corn still work? Well, maybe in some cases it does. I would encourage you to maybe calculate both ways. Again, if you're pricing it with a neighbor, it needs to be a win-win situation, obviously, for everyone, particularly if we plan on doing this again next year. Another way that we can do this is we can look at the actual starch content once we start getting some samples back and calculate based on tonnage yield as well as starch content to convert it back to the number of bushels that we would have had harvested per acre in the corn silage. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers and growers to work together and maybe calculate the price of corn silage a couple different ways to make sure that we're treating each other fairly this year. Thanks, Mike. And that'll do it for the Tuesday edition of Agriculture Today. For Samantha Bennett, I'm Jeff Wickman. Thanks for joining us on the K-State Radio Network. Thank you.